peace everybody welcome back to randomly selected i'm your host mario smith i very rarely say my last name on this show although it's on everything but yeah i'm mario anyway today on randomly selected uh we have my man lawrence holmes from the score sports radio 670 here in chicago um an amazing amazing cat he is one of the premier broadcasters in our city in our nation in fact um but little known fact maybe not so little known he is the baby brother of a very famous dj by the name of braxton holmes some of you may have heard of him and this brother lawrence used to have to carry his big brother crates and that's a thing if you don't know carrying crates back in the day not only did it build your music knowledge it also built your muscle we also talked to him about his start in broadcasting and how it was started by his love of sports as an athlete and how his mom pushed him into the direction of becoming the Lawrence Holmes we love now and hear every day. Ladies and gentlemen, Randomly Selected presents Mr. Lawrence Holmes. Lawrence Holmes! Welcome to Randomly Selected, Lawrence Holmes. What's up, brother? I appreciate you having me on this because I look at the people that you've already had on this and I feel like you are really reaching to the bottom of the barrel <laughs> by asking you by you're asking funny. me to come be on this Get podcast. Get out of here. Now, I, I, uh, I will say this off the top. Um, the reason why I wanted you on here is it's a few reasons. I, I, my goal is to get you, Jason, and uh, Jay Hood on. Okay. At some point. I feel like... For- my, my, my question to you is... Is Eric one of those people that hasn't figured out that he knows me? He has and that, he, and that Braxton is my brother. He he knows that. Okay. And he has kind of figured it out because I had to remind him. I'm like, you know this Braxton's brother, right? Cause that's like my favorite <laughs> thing right now. Like it's so funny to me where there are people that are in the concentric circle, right. like you, right, who are like, oh, you know. You've made the connection a long time ago, other than the fact that me and him look exactly look alike. Exa- we all, except you wear glasses. I wear glasses and I'm six inches shorter. That's but it. we look exactly alike. <laughs> but it's always funny to me. Like I get people who hit me up and they put it together and they're like, wait a minute. I saw you, I saw you post about Braxton Holmes. Like, are y'all related? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's my big brother. Like, we grew up in the same house, so people think it's weird. So I always want to know, like, where... Because people say to me, like, oh, y'all see you out in the streets, and you're, and you're blah, 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 blah. I'm like, you have no idea. Dude. I have been... <laughs> I remember going with my brother to Betty's Blue Star. Yeah, yeah. He was DJing that night. And I would finish my radio show and I go over there and there was this man there with all of my brother's records, like all of them trembling. Whoa. Like shaking. Whoa. Like my brother walked up to him and he was like holding out the Sharpie <laughs> and was shaking. And I was like, man, you are so famous. He is like dumbass famous. Yeah. He's, he's really famous. Yeah. When you it, get it, shouted out like that yeah. by big luminaries in yeah. the business like he has, you yeah. are definitely famous. It's funny. I knew him before I knew you. And when I would hear your voice on the radio, I, I'm not joking. I'd be like, man, that dude sounds so familiar to me. And I can't think of why I know it. And I think it was a, it was a Wicker Park time that you guys were like together for yeah. something. Yeah. And that's when I, I it clicked. I'm like, I bet they're related. And then I, I don't know how I ran into him or you. And you go, you know, that's my brother. I'm like, get out of here. Yeah, well, for a long time, my name wasn't Lawrence. It was Braxton's uh, brother. It's Braxton's little brother. That's right. Little Braxton, that happened a lot, too, <laughs> <laughs> when I was younger. But, I mean, there are people who still identify me as Braxton's little brother. Like, that's people that you. don't know about, like, that aren't into sports or whatever. Yeah. Like, they see me, hey! Hey, you Braxton's little brother. I'm like, uh huh. Yep, I sure am. That's and that, that's like Braxton's like favorite story. <laughs> like what he tells people when they go, "Oh my God, you're Lawrence's brother." He's like, "Nope, Lawrence is my brother." <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, Grady. It's the truth. That's funny. He's like, I was here first. Lawrence is my brother. <laughs> and, and, and with that in mind, he um, 
And, and you know, I, I want to make sure that 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 Braxton, because I know he's going to hear this, that he understands how loved he is in this world. Yeah. By damn near everybody. He has always been in you, too. And, and it, I, I met your mother and father. I know where it comes from. You are two really level headed cats, very much on the on the mark about everything. And radio stuff aside and him being this unbelievably famous DJ aside, I think that speaks a lot to just character. You know what I'm saying? And it's a, it's a lost art having a, a, a soul. In, I, in I hope so. Person. And I, I will tell you that I learned a lot from kind of watching him move. Like he doesn't even know this. Like I don't tell him because he'll get big headed but <laughs> I, I watched him I used to carry his crates back in the day like when my brother's five years older than me so I was getting into places that I had no business right. being in because Braxton was DJing he's 17 yep he was doing parties you know so I would see how he moved and I think about it's so weird like now knowing that people were coming through our basement, like Casual came through our basement, Daje came through our basement. Like these were all people that I just thought were my brother's friends. Yeah, you know, like they they were just the people that he hung out with. And then you you start to look at like the collection of music that they put together throughout that time. It's really really amazing. Mm -hmm. But I will watch how he moved, and my brother's a lot. I'm very loud. He's not loud unless he has to be. <laughs> and just seeing him try to move through some of these spaces and the level of respect that he gets when he's out in these streets, is it was really inspiring. Yeah. What led you... I mean, I know that, that you had a budding baseball career. Mm -hmm. Again, as I wrote on Twitter, the walk off the mound when you threw the pitch, the first pitch at the White Sox game, says all anybody needs to know about your athleticism. Yeah. That's a that's that's always an indicator to me when a pitcher leaves after he throws a really good pitch, and it's like that, like a Lance Lynn, and this is before he became a member of the White Sox. Lance Lynn gets that third strike; it's his walk off the mound. It's like, yep, I got you. What, and with all the athletics and stuff in mind, how did you take that passion and move it toward wanting to be on the radio? This is all props to my mom, honestly. Like, she I, she knows how important she is, number one, to me, but mm -hmm. to my actual career. So we grew up in Roseland. My yes. brother went to Mendel. Mendel closed. He was the last graduating class out of Mendel. Wow. So Mendel closes, and my parents were like, well, what, what are we going to do with Lawrence? Um, and I think that it, it, it may have something to do with they think that I was probably like a little bit of a softer soul when I was younger. Right. So the choices were, I was we lived right across the street from Finger. And during that time, that was not necessarily <laughs> the place to be. Exactly. I had taken classes at Harlan when I was in seventh and eighth grade. So that was on the docket. My father taught at Washington. Okay. So that was a possibility. And then, you know, the Catholic school route, like Brother Rice, like that was a place where I was thinking about going. And they had just kind of decided, screw it, we're gonna move. Like we had family and friends out south. And and so they moved, we moved to, to Homewood. Mm -hmm. and. When I got there, like I went kicking and screaming like I, my brother was he was out of high school. So it wasn't that big of a deal to him. And right. he could drive and he could go back and see his friends. It was it was horrible mm. for me. Like it was all I knew. Like the 108 bus was all I yes, knew. I rode that bus many a day. It was all I knew, <laughs> you know, and we got out there and that first summer was rough. Like I met a few really cool people and. One of my, like, we have a, a family friend that's part of the reason that we moved out there. And she's still one of my best friends to today. And she was a year ahead of me at HF. Mm -hmm. But I got hurt playing basketball freshman year. And so I was a serial casted for six months. Wow. Like, it was bad. Wow. I, I jammed my ankle so bad they had to fuse three bones into one. Jesus Christ. So it's triple arthrodesis surgery. I still have a screw and four staples in my right ankle. So when it rains, man. <laughs> so I was I I was really 
out of sorts. Like I was away from everything that I knew. I was hurt. Like athletics was kind of the way that I had athletics and academics. My father would be so mad that I didn't say academics, but mm. athletics was kind of the way that I set myself apart. Like right. I was, I played on a Jackie Robinson West team that played, you know, that went one state, you know, like, yeah. so I was in the regional. We didn't, we got beat by some team in Ohio, but, um, that was my way to connect with people. And I didn't have that. My mother suggested because she had read everything about home with Flossmore high school. Like she knew everything about it. She said, you know, they have a radio station. Like you could talk about sports. And I was mm. like, mm, really? So I went to try out. They had these newsreader tryouts and this is when I met Ben Bradley. Ben Bradley and I have been friends for 30 years. ABC7, Ben, formerly ABC7, currently WGN. Now Channel 9. Yeah. You should have him on the podcast. He's an interesting dude. Yeah, I would love to have a chat with him. Um, <laughs> we've known each other for 30 years. And, and the story of us like becoming friends was, new, he was like the news director dude. Because, I mean, look at him. Like The same guy that he is now on Channel 9 is the same guy that he was <laughs> nice. when we were in high school. Nice. So he gave me copy, and I'm sure, like, I didn't know a lot of people because I we had just moved in or whatever. Yeah. So I didn't go to junior high with any of these people. So I'm sure he's like, I don't know this cat. It was a little bit dismissive. And then I told him, I was like, yo, man, you spelled Gorbachev wrong. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he was like, you're hired. <laughs> like wow. immediately so wow. we've been friends ever since that wow so it was it was that that my mom pushing me to saying you can do other things with sports that kind of put me on this path eventually i got better i got back to playing sports mm -hmm. and and everything was cool but i got a taste for loving performing and talking about sports they gave me a dj shift so I got to play music and we had this rock format, like the format for WHFH 88.5 Flossmore was, <laughs> there you go. was, was the loop. Yeah. Sweet. So it Sweet. exposed me to all sorts of stuff musically. And this is about the time when grunge is kicking through the door yeah. on the music scene. But if it weren't for my mom, I, I don't know if I would have channeled that correctly like if i would have been able to to really take and process what had happened to me yeah and turned it into a positive and what she ended up giving me was a career so i can uh, from experience speak to the fact that being on the radio for as long as i have been 20 years thank you very much uh you will meet from time to time an occasional program director that wants you to stay in your box stay in your lane don't be yourself follow the pie chart play the hit at the top of the hour and at the bottom of the hour at least that happened to me when i was in south carolina that's for another show lawrence however has added his own niche to all of the programming he does it's a very unique situation he finds himself in and i wanted to know how did you get there it's definitely something that you have to navigate and it's weird i've been thinking about this a lot over the last I would say probably over the last six months or so, because there, I had a contract negotiation with the score and I was trying to decide if I wanted to come back. And this happens every two years, like mm -hmm. my deals up every two years. And I kind of go through all of this stuff. And a lot of times I would find myself going, OK, I'm going to I'm going to go do something else like I'm going to go do television or whatever. And. I found myself after everything that happened with NBC saying, God, you know, I feel a freedom at the score that I don't feel mm. any other place outside of like doing my podcast. And that's something that I think is taking time to develop. I think that even when I started doing radio, it's like, well, this is the way that it, it's been done. Mm -hmm. And you try to figure out oh well this worked for this person and this worked for this person so that's the way that it has to be it's, it can be very formulaic i would say starting in 2009 that's about where i felt some freedom to experiment so i always love to tell this story 
I had this show with Dan Hampton. Yes, you did. It it didn't go well. And I wasn't prepared for it to not go well. Mm. I kind of had the... I always had the feeling of Lupe Fiasco. You know, if you are what you say you are. Like, that's kind of how I went into it. And I was like, I'm really good at driving a show. So it doesn't matter... Who you put next to me, I'll do it. I'll figure out a way to make it work. Right. Now it didn't work on radio. Hamp and I have a great relationship still. And when we did TV together on Channel 5, I think that the things that we were hoping to do as a radio duo came through on television. Mm -hmm. So I found that that when I think about my time with Hamp, I think of a couple of things. One, I found out that he and I are great television partners. Two, I made a lifelong friend with one of my heroes. And three, he's a hell of a musician. Really? Oh, my God. What does he play? He plays everything. Really? He plays the bass. He plays piano. He plays the saxophone. So he got hurt when he had back surgery because, you know, he has like 100 surgeries yeah, yeah. while we were doing the show. And so they set it up so that he could do the show at home. So we'd be in the middle of a break. I go into the control studio and he'd be playing piano. The guy's amazing. Like he's amazing. And I'm so happy that I worked with him. But from a radio standpoint, like our show started in baseball season. It wasn't it wasn't the best way for us to start a show. Yeah. Had we started it in football season, I think we could have we could have parlayed it into something. But I I say this. This is not what happened to me. This is just the way that I see it in my head. I felt exiled to nights mm. after that. And it wasn't that. It was, hey, we think that you're valuable. This didn't work, but we can make this work. Why don't you go back to doing a show by yourself? And I... People will say to me that you, know, you like doing a show by yourself. And I'm like, that's not true. I'd rather... I'd rather do a show where it's a collective, but I had a partnership really early in my career with a guy named Dan Zampillo. Yes, sir. And I really thought that it could turn into something. I that thought was that me we, and Z, right? Yep, me and Z show. I thought that it could turn, we could turn into a really great radio duo. He had different plans, and I I had to learn to accept that mm. like that. That's nobody's fault. It's just that he had a different and now he's like running podcasts for Spotify. Yeah, he is. So, <laughs> I mean, obviously, like his plan was the right yeah. one for him. Yeah. So I, I had this. I had this. I felt like I was being exiled tonight. And luckily, at the same time, the morning show had made a change of executive producers and they decided, you know, that Joe Ostrowski wasn't the right guy for the morning show. So Joe ends up on the night show. So I always talk about us as the exiles. Like we were the two guys that were exiled together hmm. and we hadn't worked together before, but my partnership with Joe as him being my producer, I think is the most important like flashpoint of my career because he understood like my hunger and my drive and I was pissed off yeah. about everything and I wanted to succeed, but I needed to figure out how. And he helped me like he helped streamline that. Like We we vibe like our vibration is like super strong about what we think makes good content. And he was like, hey, man, it's a nighttime show. There are there like no suits are here. Do your thing. Do your thing. Yeah, do your thing. And if it, if, if it wasn't for Joe, I think that I probably could have descended into some bitterness yeah. about it. But he made it fun. And then you start adding people. Chris Tannehill, Herb Lawrence, you know, uh, Roki, Chris Ranji. Yeah. Like all of these people came around the show and we, we had created it. And if you look at House of L, like most of the people that are on it are people that were part of what I like to call – the nighttime show because they they get what I was trying to do. I wanted to make it fun and I wanted to be 
I kind of based the nighttime show off of Dan Patrick and Dan Lebitar. Mm. Like that was the goal where yeah. I'm the centerpiece of the show, right? Right. Right, right? But there's so much cool shit going on around me right. that I get to just kind of sit back and go, wow, this is pretty crazy. Wait, wait, before, before we go any further, just for the uninitiated, you mentioned Chris Tannehill. There are a lot of heads in Chicago who who will not know Chris Tannehill by Chris Tannehill, but they know him Cosm by Cosm Rocks. Cosm yeah. Rocks. I mean, you talk about when we started talking about great DJs and yeah, Chris Tannehill, man. I mean, no disrespect to anyone. He's the best sound man in the period. world. Period. It's easy. I, I listen to a lot of radio, dude. I, can, I still marvel at just how he works. And he's how so he great. That he's really, really he good. He has a great job. ear and he has a great ear for everything. Mm -hmm. And he's so fundamentally strong and yeah. he has such a great background in every type of music that he pulls from all over the place. So when I got that type of production firepower, yeah, I got Joe telling me, do whatever you want. We're going to support you. We're going to make this great. I got Tannehill and Herb saying, let's make some fun, creative stuff. Let's play with the genre. It, it really put me in a position where I could take off. And that, that's, that's where... Like if I'm doing superhero origin story, <laughs> right? Like, right. In my mind, it's me and Joe being kicked out of a restaurant <laughs> and landing like next to each other and being like, "What'd you do?" Right. Oh, <laughs> you did. You know what we should do? We should do a show. Right. Cool. Let's do and, a show. And and that's where you know we we kind of have the genesis of of what ended up happening over the next decade. You know the funny thing if that show doesn't become the Lawrence Holmes show nighttime, the Fife dog interview never happened. A hundred percent. Like we, th there's no space to do some of that stuff. And I, I honestly, I'll tell you, um, as we're recording this, I just finished this amazing conversation with Roger Bennett. Yeah. And From it was Blaine's reminiscent head. of what we did at night. Now I have some constraints now cause I have two hours and there it's compressed a yeah. lot. And today was one of those days where I was just like, fuck it. Yeah. We're, we're letting this ride. So, I believe at the end you were like, I don't care. I know I went over. I don't care. It was 25 care. minutes. Like that's, yeah. there's, it, on the nighttime show, I knew because of the way the spots were. And at nighttime, the spots cost less money and there are usually less of them. But I knew at the top of the hour, I had 25, 27 minutes to play with. If It was something that was good. Mm -hmm. And... I left some space open on the back end of the top of the hour because I figured it was going to be good. It was better than I imagined. But again, that's, that's an executive producer. Like that's Joe Ostrowski saying to me, let it like, let it, let it eat. Yeah, man. Do your thing with those things. And I always felt like I wasn't a great interviewer. Now I was good in press conferences because I was covering the Bears every day. I'm quick with the, you know, jumping yeah. in there, finding a space. But I wanted to become a better interviewer. So I took it upon myself to really start listening to people who do interviews all the time and try to take a little bit of what they do and add it to what I do to, to make myself a better interviewer. I wanted to cut down on, on questions. I wanted to make sure, and that's why I teach my students all the time, how, what, why. Those are that's the foundation that's of being a great interviewer. Uh, unless you, you know, like if you have a conversation like me and you, like we go back like rocking chairs. So right, right. it's just two bros talking. Right. But when you have someone that you don't know, like you got to give them space to talk. And that's that became kind of a strength going forward where I would get emails from my boss the next day. He'd be like, hey, someone who isn't involved with the radio station told me about your interview with blank. I went back and listened to it. That was amazing. Mm. So it, those types of things are things that have pushed me on a, as a performer, as an interviewer. And the nighttime show, like I, I think about that time in my life like very romantically because I was given an opportunity to really explore what it is we do. Yeah. And we found some things that didn't work and we found some things that truly work. And so getting that opportunity four years ago to then move to the middle of the day, it was a it was a major victory. 
for me. Major. Lawrence Holmes is our guest today on Randomly Selected. And he had the pleasure of doing one of the greatest interviews, actually twice, that I've ever heard on the radio with Fife Dog. That's right, Dog. Stopped into Chicago, rolled up on him and, and let him have it, man. His knowledge of sports, the whole deal, hip hop and everything. Um, Lawrence also has a great podcast called The House of L and it recently reached 1 million downloads. He's the million dollar man. That's that's pretty impressive too. And we also talked to him about his experiences applying for college again after having been out of the school world for 20 years and going to Alabama Roll Tide and how when you say Alabama Roll Tide you have to always say Alabama Roll Tide so here's Lawrence talking about his experiences and all those things Roll Tide so we got Fife in studio twice right okay and that's right. that's all Herb Lawrence like Herbie did that he he knew that Fife had been in town and he he had been right down the street because remember they were doing the the McDonald's All American back at U of C. That's right. Back then, that's right. And they were doing like the dunk contest, and he was here for that. And you're right, like he's a ridiculous sports fan. Yeah. And he reps hard. Like so, let's say like he was in Chicago, right? He walks into the studio. He's wearing a Blackhawks cap. Mm -hmm. Like he reps it hard wherever it is that he goes. And he's like, I went to Wrigley the other day, and blah 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 blah. I d the first time that he came through, I didn't believe it. Mm. Like I was sitting there going. Herbie's telling me, hey, you know, we might get Fife tonight. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Fife's going to come down here in right. the middle of the night right. to talk to me about sports. Right. And then Herbie, like, I saw the phone ring in the uh, production studio and I saw his eyes, like, light up. He's like, Fife's downstairs. And, and he went and got him and he brought him up. And I was just in awe. Yeah. Because, you know, a tribe called Quest is, is, like that's a soundtrack to my life. Absolutely. Like you know, Absolutely. going all the way back. Like, and, and I'm a fan of Midnight Marauders, and me and Tanny actually talk a lot about how it feels like people sleep on Midnight Marauders a little bit. Midnight Marauders was freshman year college to me. Right. And then what was at the time their last album was senior year for me. Right. So I have all of this stuff. With Tribe, and I'm a huge Q-Tip fan. I, I love it, everything about his style and his musical choices and risks that he's taken. To connect with Fife and have him come in and talk to me about sports. And sometimes when I talk with celebrities about sports, um, I'm sure our 44th president is uh, is one of them. Sometimes, like they know surface stuff, like yeah. they know enough to get them through an interview <laughs> on a sports station before they can be like, "Vote for me" or whatever it is that they're doing. All right. With Fife, we we got down to brass tacks on stuff. Like he wanted to know the vibe of the city. He wanted to know what's the difference between going to a game at Wrigley and a game on the South Side, and his knowledge of ball. Like talking to him about basketball, was, yeah, man. He was really amazing. It's it's a career highlight for me. Yeah, that not only did he do the one interview, he and you know I'm sure you hear this from people. You talk to famous folks all the time. Oh man, love to come back on, and then you never hear from them again. Exactly. Five came back the next year. Yep. He I was in town, and yep. he came back the next year. Yep. And we picked up where we had left off, and it was just cool. So when, when you found out that he was really sick, and he had during a break, like we had talked a little bit about it, but you find out that he was really sick. It was tragic. Like all of it was really tragic, but very powerful to have someone like that be willing to connect with you on a level that you weren't expecting like he just yeah. the absolute dopest man i think one of the interviews i wish i could have got i never got is with timbuktu Dude. i feel the same way when i found out i found out at work at the promontory because they were talking about it. i was like oh timmy's my man i've known tim since he was like 14 years old that's my boy and they just kind of looked at me and the look that they gave i was like what's wrong with him and then they told me and i was like oh wow and that is it's not a regret because I have I tried so hard to not have regrets. Sure. But I really wish I could have had a chance to sit and talk to him because I saw him grow up. 
you know, and to to a very powerful DJ dude. And I'm so happy that Illa is out here, like yeah, really man, that, carrying and, his legacy yeah, on. Yes, he he's doing an unbelievable job. It's funny you mentioned Jay Illa. Every time I see, every time I see Jay, he goes, you know, I just had a talk with Lawrence. What do you think about that? And we'll start talking about the White Sox or the Bears or something. That, yeah, man. that's my man. He that's loves man. the White Sox. Yeah, I do too. And and before I, I go into the CBS Radio, whatever happened thing. Because some people may not have heard House of Bell. Congratulations on your one millionth uh, subscriber. Yeah, download, not I'm subscriber. Sorry. If we had a million subscribers, you be sitting here I'd be probably. so rich. You'd be gone. No, I, I'd, all, I'd be here with you, and I'd still be in Hyde Park. But <laughs> You'd be like, so Mario, I've just built a studio at the top of the Hancock <laughs> building. Would you like to come and do your shows? Yeah. No, no, a man. downloads. That's, a, that's impressive. Yeah, we're... It, it's, it's crazy. It's, Wait a minute. A million downloads? It's really weird. So we started out, this started out as a class project. I, mean, I was in graduate school at Alabama, Roll Tide. Oh, here we go. I mean, it's got to be I said. Understand. And I mean, here's the thing about it. I, I, I talk lovingly about Bama and people get mad because it's like, didn't you go to DePaul? I'm like, DePaul hasn't had a football team since 1939. Um, <laughs> Word. Still undefeated. Still undefeated. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> but my connection to Bama, football is secondary for me. Yeah. It's what happened in grad school and the way that they they connected with me as a student. The Southern hospitality thing is real. Yeah. So when I was applying to different grad schools, and the whole point of me going to grad school is that I wanted to be in a position when I'm done with the industry or the industry is done with me to teach, because I love teaching. And I wanted to have my credentials in place if I wanted to teach full time. So I went into it with that mindset and I looked at a couple of different places and, you know, I was 20 years out of college when this happened. Right. So any anybody that was talking about the GRE immediately got eliminated from my list. Sorry, play. Because I'm like, I don't have time to get ready for the GRE uh, before you admit me to your grad school. <laughs> Come on, I've, been, I've done this already. So Bama, I, I'd gone through the, the application process with Bama, and then it got to the, what's your GRE score? And I was like, oh, man, that's too bad. And then I just stopped. I was like, okay, I'll move on to the next place or the next place. <clears throat> they hit me up. They were like, hey, we saw that your application, that it stopped midway through Why'd you stop? Like, we're just getting feedback. And I said, well, you know, I graduated college in 97. I'm 20 years out of college. Yeah. I'm not taking the GRE. Yeah. They were like, oh, okay. Thank you for the feedback. Good luck on your search. I was like, oh, well, that's nice of them. The next day I get a call back from the department chair. And the department chair says, so I'm looking at your resume. Ah. Uh. Yeah. He's like, you don't need the GRE. Yeah, you should be here. Would you like to come to Alabama? Wow. And I was like, yes, I think I would. And then beyond that, like immediately, like I'm like from that moment, they're sending you stuff. They're inviting you to things. Yeah. Even though you're, I'm in Chicago. So it's Bama by distance. Mm -hmm. That is what they call it. It was an incredible experience. They asked me to come to orientation. They were like, just... You know, if you've never been to Tuscaloosa, just we'll reimburse your flight. Oh, wow. They wanted you bad. No, this was for Mario. It's for everybody. Oh, wow. If well, I guess they can do that. If you're willing to go, <laughs> yeah. they will figure out a way to make it okay. I will enroll tomorrow. So I went down there and I said, oh, wow, I've never had an experience like this. Because yeah. DePaul is still the little school under the L tracks. A football school is a whole different animal but yeah. i digress the whole point is that the classes that i took the professors that i had there made it easy for me to try stuff and new media is where they wanted to go so one of my class projects was create a media company and i had thought about doing a podcast a couple years before and i said well why don't i just create this and my professor professor wilson lowry he said to me you could just do this for the class. And I was like, work? Wow. Cool. So then he helped me like kind of put together how I wanted to do it and 
what my focus was going to be and the technological support. Like they really allowed you to learn it as a business. So I can't say, I won't say one bad word about Alabama because my experience at Bama was top notch. Like even through graduation, it's the same thing where I didn't have to go to Tuscaloosa to get my degree. Yeah. But they were like, would you like to come to Tuscaloosa to get your degree? Oh, I saw the pictures. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I really would. And they paid for it. Wow. They reimbursed me for the flight to Birmingham. And it's like 40 minute drive from Birmingham to Tuscaloosa. That's why they are getting so many kids from the Chicagoland area. Because you want to go be you know, championship football, crazy experience on campus, like all that good stuff. Tuscaloosa is legitimately two and a half hours from here. Yep. It's a 90 minute flight yep. to Birmingham and yep. then you drive to, to Tuscaloosa. Yep. So that's how House of L started. And it's been a really cool experience. I don't, someone asked me like, how do you do all this stuff? And I was like, I don't know, but it doesn't feel like work when I'm doing the podcast mm. because like, that's my baby, yeah. you know, like that's, yeah. And it's turned out really well, and I've had really smart people on the podcast and doing episodes of the podcast for me. Um, I don't know if you saw it, like, because you know, I don't know when people are on Twitter when they're not. We did an episode, Kat Garcia, who is an amazing baseball personality. She's unbelievable. She interviewed Jack White. Yep. And. No one had the audio because she had it. It was one on one, her and Jack White. And so I talked with her. She's like, yeah, I found it. And I said, do you want to put it out? And she goes, I, I, yeah, I mean, I want to, but it's just off of like a recorder. I, I was like, send me the sound. I'll remaster it. Mm-hmm. And there's 15 minutes of Jack White talking about baseball. Those are things that would be hard to duplicate on a radio station. But in the world of doing a podcast, you could play around with the art that way. And people love that episode. Like yeah. I love doing that. Like I love the creative aspect of doing that podcast. The only issue I have now is I, I think there needs to be two of me. There needs, needs to be a separation of church and state <laughs> right. where I can, you know, Lawrence one can be in charge of creative and Lawrence two can be in charge of the business. Lawrence Holmes hosted a radio program on CBS radio that was dope. And then it was gone. And I wanted to know what happened to the show, bro. Even though he broke it down on his own podcast. You know me. I got to ask the question. Also, we talked about black athletes taking a position on mental health and wellness. Pretty cool stuff from my man, Lawrence. Check it out. Okay. So they came to me and they said, John Kincaid, who had been doing the morning show at CBS Sports Radio for a long time, was taking a, a Monday through Friday job. I want to say in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. He said, would you be interested? And I said, yeah, you know, like that seems fun. I've always wanted to see if I can play on the national level. He said, well, here's the thing. <laughs> it's you know, six to ten Eastern. So on Saturday or Sunday mornings. And I said, OK. And my boss, you know, Mitch Rosen, he wants to promote his talent. So he is telling the people at CBS, like, I have this great host. You know, he can do it. You're going to love him. And I said, I want to try it. Like, I want to try it out. So I'm doing it, and it's hard. Now, I used to produce a morning show. I've produced a morning show, and I've hosted a national morning, uh, national morning show when I worked with Michael Kim for 120 Sports and Stadium right. Network. Right. So I'm a little used to the schedule of it. And obviously, this is in the middle of the pandemic. I have a codec unit at home, so I could actually do the show from home. Right. Still, even with all of those things in place, it was way too much. Mm. Um, And it's the first time in my career where I allowed myself to say, you're doing too much and take a step back. Did you feel like it was affecting your health? Oh, my God, yeah. Like, I hurt my back at... I got the offer like not too long after I hurt my back and I was, you know, we weren't, none of us were really moving you know, during the pandemic. Yeah, and yeah. I found myself being more sedentary than I usually am. 
and all the devices that you have to work through that stuff. Like gyms weren't open, like all that stuff. Right. Uh, I had my bike, but it was winter, you know, so right, it wasn't right. wasn't like I was really getting down on that either. My back was killing me, and I would, I was like, man, this is I'm putting in a lot of work to get up at three forty five on a Sunday morning to hobble over to my office and mm. and go do this show and it doing the work was and prepping a national show i found to be stimulating i really truly did and i hope that i get another opportunity to do it i just wasn't mentally physically in the right place when you add that to everything else that yeah. i was doing yeah i wasn't and I told my boss, like I said, look, I want to, I want to give you a heads up. It's like, I, I think I'm done, but I want to go another month of shows just to be sure. Mm -hmm. And he was open to it. And, and we, we, me and CBS parted on good terms. Like I still guest over there and, and all that. Everyone knows that that's a hard thing to ask. Like being on that particular schedule while doing a show five days a week right. is a hard thing to ask. Like my Saturdays were, I was useless on Saturdays and most of Sunday. Yeah. And, and that didn't give me enough time to recharge and be ready for your show on Monday for my show on Monday. Right. So that that's, there's nothing nefarious. Like there's nothing, <laughs> there's no great story other than I was tired. Word. You, um, you are amazing, bro. I, I can I, get, I said it earlier. I'll say it again. You, Jason Goff, and and Jonathan Hood are like the brothers I've never had. I love you guys. I'm so glad that I listen because I am stealing from the three of you all the time. Hey, uh, we 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 encourage it. Like yeah. we encourage people to to take from us and then use the things that they have naturally gifted to to be themselves on the air and. When you talk about you know, me, Jason, and Hood, we are three distinctly different human beings. Absolutely. On the air. Absolutely. And yet, we came from the same place, and you can tell where Jason got an influence from me, right. where I got an influence from Hood. Right. You know, where Hood got an influence from Rush Ewing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know he's going to hear I know he'll he'll probably agree, <laughs> or or like where where I got something from Herb Kent, right, right. or Tom Joyner, or like right. or whomever, like right. you can hear it, and and I I love that sports radio has gotten to a place where there's room for each of us, yeah, there's room yeah. for us to be ourselves, and it's the most important thing on the air where I I now do a crazy dance party at the beginning of the show, yeah, you do, and I like it. And people have responded responded to it, and that level of freedom allows for more creativity. And and with that creativity, you can create something pretty special. Thanks, man. I, I We're look. done. Yeah, brother. Oh, all right, I'm not in a rush. <laughs> All right. I we'll, see you kicking me off your no, podcast like, now. We'll, we'll, All right. We'll have to do it. We'll have to do a part two. I see. I see how it is. We'll have to do a part. You funny. We'll have to do a part two. I bet you didn't kick Amara out of here. Well, you did. You'd be like, hey, that's Marania. That's I, true. She walked me across Future the mayor of Chicago. you damn right. You heard the bridge story. I did. I couldn't kick her out. I felt bad for you. I didn't know that you had that bridge thing. <laughs> and it's got a name, and I swear I can't remember the name of it, but so, yeah. So wait, like, does it have to be like a big bridge? Or like, can you walk over the bridge in the Japanese garden? Yes. Okay. That I can do. I still have to kind of like make sure that I'm close to the rail, which is weird because you would figure I would want to be in the middle in case the rail broke. So... If when I'm talking about you getting to 95th, ain't nothing happening. East player. side, no sir. I can't. I there's can't. no way you going over that. Not on a bike. I have to be in a on, in a car or on a bus. Huh. Although Kingfish is that way, and I used to live in the Manor, so when it be, I I can do that. And and, and again, part of <laughs> this is crazy. Here we go with the bridge story again. Part of it is a good friend of mine jumped in the Chicago River to save somebody and passed away, and it has. It was traumatizing. It's, hey, man, trauma and, is real, and, yo. and every time... Real quick, I know I said goodbye, but I got to do this real quick. Your me Mercedes comes flying out the gate 
with the White Sox. They needed him, and he came through. He gets eviscerated by the manager, Tony La Russa, because he did his job and got a hit when my man threw a beach ball to him, and he killed it. He goes, he, he, he struggles mightily after that. And then he gets sent down to, to Charlotte, to AAA. And then he says, I have to go. I quit. Came back the next day and all. You on the air said something very profound about, we don't know what his mental state was. We know what happened, but we don't really know how it affected him. It seems that it manifested in him saying, I have to retire. Simone Biles, the most decorated gymnast, the most decorated Olympic athlete in history, who could have easily, after the last Olympiad, said, I'm good, I'm analyzing for NBC, I'm done, came back to be a mentor to these young women, pulled herself out of everything in the last couple of days, as we record this, and she stated her mental health. Naomi Osaka, so many different athletes. Really quickly, the position that... Athletes of color, black athletes in particular, are starting to take about their mental health and wellness. Do you see that as a trend in American sports and sports in general? Considering the pressure that black athletes are under. I do. And and yet again, here are black women leading the way on on some of this. Thank goodness. Chris Bryant was talking about it in context of Simone Biles Hmm. and saying how he understands exactly what she's talking about. I follow Michaela Maroney on Instagram and I started following her after the Nasser trial because she had some really profound stuff to say about it, mm-hmm. about what Simone Biles was going for. She explained that not only is it you're, you're concerned about performance, you're concerned about hurting yourself. That, she said it's called twisties that all gymnasts go through it it's the it's the equivalent of the yips yep it's the gymnastic equivalent of the yips and she said that it happened to her mm. and she fell on her head oh my god and, and suffered a concussion and that's the danger in it so like when i see people trying to go after simone biles who's honestly like one of our greatest americans period and i, I just go where is your level of empathy for her so yes i do see it as being um, more okay to talk about a lot of these different issues i'm i'm friends i I guess maybe i should say mentor to sarah gordon Mm. who plays for the chicago red star she was one of my students at depaul okay and i i she's a fascinating young lady she's so smart she's so in tune with everything surrounding the black lives matter movement surrounding her own like identity as athlete and woman and person it's inspiring to see stuff like that and and seeing her reaction to it like i i kind of take my marching orders from her Mm -hmm. in this like i'm a 46 year old man you know i'm i'm let, let me see what people who are in the know are saying about it and i i see most athletes get it there are times when someone needs a push or a kick in the ass to get stuff done. And there are people who are appreciative of that. I'm one of those people. There are also times when that's not going to cut it and you need to walk away. And I'm, I'm really thankful to Simone and to Naomi Osaka and any other athlete that is working through some of this stuff. The importance of just saying, I need a break. Here's why not that you have to give a reason, but here's why. And with your mean in particular, I felt for him. Yeah. I've, I was surprised at, at how hard some people went after your mean, to tell you the truth. It was a little disheartening. Um, I felt for him because think about it. You were, th- it was Shohei Otani and your mean Mercedes. Yes, it was. For, for the, the first for six month. weeks yeah. of yeah, the baseball right. season. Those were the two stories. He hits the plateau. He goes. He there's the home run. There's maybe some backlash organizationally from it. His teammates rallied around him. He had that support system. That even though he was going through a rough time, he was here. Once you send him down to the minors, knowing that you then need catching help, and he's a catcher, and he's hitting like 300 in the minors. Like yeah. he didn't go back there and stink. To then go back to the minors. And not even have the support system. Forget about the support system that was at 35th and Shields. Mm -hmm. He doesn't even have the support system of the guys that he used to play with in Charlotte. Because all the guys from Charlotte are playing for the White Sox right now. 
Right. He walks back into Charlotte into a clubhouse where it's like I don't, I don't know what's going on. So I, I really feel for him. I hope that he. I understand the baseball reasons why he's not with the White Sox. Like, I got no beef with the White Sox on that. They're trying to win a World Series, and they don't have a lot of spots that they can give away right, right now. Right. I hope her, your mean gets another chance because – and if he doesn't, he should look at his career as a success. I mean, you were AL Rookie of the Month in the month of April. You took the league by storm. Carried but a team for a month. Carried a team that's probably going to win a World Series or at least have a chance to win a World Series – on your back for a month. I have mad respect for that dude yeah. and how he toiled in the minor leagues, and I just want him to be okay. Yeah. All right. Lawrence Holmes, thank you so much, brother. I, 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 I am indebted, man. Thank you. Thanks, man. I'm looking forward to the invitation for part two since, like, you don't want me on your podcast. <laughs> this is not how this is supposed to end. <laughs> thank you, brother. I appreciate you, man. Thank you. Thanks so much for checking us out again. What is this, episode 13? 12? 50? Something like that. 12. <laughs> we, we keep doing them. You keep listening, and we really appreciate it. Please tell your friends to check out Randomly Selected, and don't forget to subscribe, please, whatever platform it is. Subscribe to the program. You'll never know who you'll hear. With that in mind, our next episode coming up on the first of the month will be with my block my hood my city's very own jamal cole he is running for bobby rush's seat in congress we talk about a lot of stuff involving him including how he went to nebraska right we got all of that and more on the next randomly selected but before we go silver room myself and everybody we want to send something out to tony fernandez's family tony fernandez ran tony sports for many years here in chicago he passed away recently and i promise you i promise you all of the fly stuff that you like in chicago the boutiques and the pop-ups and all that and cats who have made a wonderful name for themselves they all went through tony sports at one time or another even if it was tony giving them advice he was a great dude and we honor him here on randomly selected and we wish the best for his family and may his journey be peaceful thanks for listening y'all catch you soon peace